we get into the episode, I have to tell you about the simplest and best way to start mining Bitcoin, the Blockware Marketplace. Our new streamlined onboarding process means you can literally buy a Bitcoin mining rig and start mining in under 60 seconds. All of the machines available for sale in the marketplace are online right now at one of Blockware's facilities. You don't have to worry about lead times or finding a place to get your machine plugged in. Blockware has already taken care of that for you. You get to mine completely hassle-free. And if at any point you decide that you no longer want to mine, or if the price of ASICs increases and you want to capitalize on the higher value of your machine, you can list your rig for sale at any time and at any price. This platform has completely changed the landscape of hosted Bitcoin mining. And the best part is that this all takes place using Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. Get started today at marketplace.blockwaresolutions.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Blockware Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Mr. British Hoddle. British, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this one. Me too. So I've been following you on Twitter for a while, and Bitcoin's kind of complicated. And I think anything we could do to simplify it is the way to go. And you've simplified Bitcoin into three steps. Can you tell us what those three steps are? Well, it's step number one, you buy Bitcoin. Step number two, shut the f- up. And step number three, you get fabulously wealthy. I don't know how it can get more simpler than that. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. If I had to make one kind of tweak, I would probably put between one and two, uh, take take it off the exchange into self-custody. But Like a one, one A or a one B. Yeah, exactly. So when you say shut the f- up, do you mean like, be anonymous, don't tell people you're holding Bitcoin because it's going to be worth so much in the future or just sort of like hodl and like don't worry about the volatility. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's not like stop talking about it. It's just don't worry about it. But everyone likes to take it as don't stop talking about it. And of course, that's not that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, for sure. So what's your Bitcoin origin story? How did you find it? And you know, did you have a certain like educational background that helped you understand it? No, so I got into business when I was uh, 15 and a half years old, watching my dad negotiate property deals. And one day my arrogance took control of me. And when he got off the phone, I said, that shit looks easy. And, uh, and instead of telling me to, to take a hike, he, you know, he told me to prove it. He said, show me. Show me that it's easy. And so that's what I started doing at a very, very young age and then moved from real estate, stocks, gold, and then finally Bitcoin. Um, I thought Bitcoin was a scam in 2017. I bought a bunch of Bitcoin, doubled my money, got out with a, with a, with my best friend thinking that we'd paid for six months worth of cigars and everything was good and Bitcoin was a scam and it was going to disappear. And then in 2020, a bunch of people that I respect a lot started getting into Bitcoin and I couldn't understand why. And then one of the guys uh, told me to listen to the Bitcoin standard and Safe Dean having a gold background intrigued me. So during the pandemic in 2020, I was walking around the park like a moron, um, listening to this book. And there was this one moment where he just says the phrase stock to flow. And it was like all of my years of experience just sort of lined up. It was like this instant, just everything just sort of lined up. And I understood it immediately why I had fucked up. And from that moment, obviously, I listened to that chapter, but coming from gold, coming from other assets, coming from understanding that it's really about credit, not about the asset, stock to just him saying stock to flow made me realize that I was looking at Bitcoin like an equity and I shouldn't have been doing that. Um, And yeah, the panic started from me as soon as Saifedean said stock to flow. Yeah, I can relate to that, that panicky feeling. You figure it out and you like, I need to like dump everything and buy as much Bitcoin as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Speaking of stock to flow, that was, th- so there's like the stock to flow concept, which is what Saifedean was talking about in his book. And then there's the stock to flow model by plan B, which was kind of not very well recepted. And that repopulated this summer, I guess, because of the crab market, people don't have anything to talk, talk about. Do you have any thoughts on stock to flow the model? Yeah, I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense. Do I think it's perfectly accurate? No, no model ever is. But I think the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that anyone from anywhere in the world with any background can put out their thoughts and we can all go, that's great, that's bullshit, I disagree, I agree, blah, blah, blah. And it's this 
worldwide honeypot of ideas. And that's beautiful. You don't get that in any other asset class. And if you, you know, to respect the plan B, the guy who put out the model, if you look at the very first model that he put out, still accurate. It had a fair value of $50,000 on Bitcoin for this cycle. Pretty accurate, right? Now, people say, oh, you know, the price didn't exactly sit on the line uh, that he creates in that model. And it's like it wasn't designed to. That's, a, that's the model price. And then the actual price fluctuates up and down above and below that line, which guess what? It has been doing. So, you know, I, I think where he slipped up a little bit uh, was when he just started adjusting the model. I think if he had just utilized the very first model, I, I, not a lot of people would have had a lot to complain about. The fact that Fidelity is putting his model in their brochure, this, yeah. you know, <laughs> like I don't care what any thousand dollar net worthers on Twitter say, if Fidelity is putting that, that model in their brochure to send to their highest net worth clients, they obviously see something in it, some value in it. Um, and so, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good contribution. Yeah, that's a good point. He definitely wins in the end, right? I mean, Anons and people with 50 followers can talk shit about his model all, the, all they want, but clearly one of the institutional giants sees value in it. And I definitely, right. I see value in it as well. And who cares if it's wrong, right? It's it's just a model. A model. All the models yeah. about Bitcoin are going to be wrong in the long run. So Absolutely. Yeah. The, great thoughts there. What do you think about Willy Woo's recent comments about how the derivatives market can be used to manipulate the spot price? So, listen, at the end of the day, what Willy said is absolutely possible. It is possible for a nation state to sell two futures contracts against every one that's bought and keep the price suppressed. My contention with what Willie said is that it would require complete political alignment in the United States. It would require complete violation of equities trading laws. It would require complete violation of commodities trading laws, and it would require a complete and fundamental uh, destruction of what makes American capital markets the number one in the world. That is unlikely to happen. So while it's, yes, possible for a nation state like America to suppress the price of an asset, if that was the case, there would have been bigger cases than the one JP Morgan got screwed for with gold. And all they, got, all they got screwed for, by the way, was spoofing. Now, what that means is, let's say the price of gold is $1,900 an ounce. They were going in there and putting market orders at $1,800 an ounce. And as the price cascaded down closer to that $1,800, they were buying up and closing those sell orders. That's it. So all of the lawsuits that have ever been done on price fixing and stuff like that have been single digit fractions of percentages on the value of the total market cap of the asset because America has figured it out. America has figured out and put laws into place to prevent exactly what Willie is talking about from happening. So while I respect his opinion on this may happen, I give it a 0.1% probability. Therefore, I don't think he should be on stage making people panic about this. But he's got the right to do what he has, just as everyone's got the right to say he's full of shit. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you said there. And I think the key point for someone who's not fully into Bitcoin, they, they hear someone say something like that, and it makes them think, oh, Bitcoin can't work because of that. But the US dollar price of Bitcoin isn't Bitcoin fundamentally. And if they're holding down the price artificially, that means hodlers like you and I can continue to buy cheap and continue to take Bitcoin off the exchange, which eventually is just going to cause a massive supply squeeze. And there's not really anything they can do about it. So Bitcoin right. really is immune to, to any sort of manipulation because the fiat price just isn't Bitcoin straight up. Right. Do you, what do you think is going on with BlackRock? Because we found out this week that they're delaying the spot ETF again. And if I were to put on my full conspiracy theorist hat, I would say they're pushing it back because they know the price will rip after and they want to buy as much cheap Bitcoin, cheap mining stocks as they can before then. Would you sort of agree with that? And what's your overall take on, on this whole BlackRock situation? Well, firstly, it's not BlackRock delaying it. It's the SEC delaying it. Yeah. 
The SEC is delaying it because there is this issue around the U.S. government shutting down. Therefore, the SEC is using that as a convenient excuse to push the ETF delays ahead of time to a new date. The one that they have not delayed, but they can't because they can't, is the GBTC one. Why? Because they delayed it as much as they could, then GBTC filed a lawsuit and GBTC won, Grayscale won. Grayscale won the lawsuit. The three judges got together and sla happy slapped the SEC as hard as they could. Now, the SEC has a couple of different choices from here, from my interpretation. They can either appeal, appeal it, and it will go to 17 judges instead of three. That makes sense in an environment where the, one of the three judges took the SEC side. Zero of the three judges took the SEC side. So... The SEC has to weigh those options up because if they go to the 17 and all 17 also decide to slap the hell out of the SEC, they're going to be in a worse position. So the SEC either has to appeal or has to show grounds under which they deny or they have to say we're going to accept this ETF. I think that the delaying of the BlackRock and the other ETFs is just it's just procedure at this point, based on what's happening with the shutdown in the government. I, I think that the ch until something happens to the GBTC one, I think the chances of a 2023 approval remain the same, which I agree with the Bloomberg intelligence guys, it's somewhere around the 50 to 75 percent mark. Uh, and if it's not 2023, then I, ha I think it happens early 2024, which would be January based on the deadlines. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I definitely think they would want to get this out there before the next halving before yeah because if you're a salesperson demand. that's what this is they want to use it and I, I said this they want to use the halving as a sales tool to get people into their product which they will earn fees from remember blackrock is not going out buying this bitcoin for themselves they might have a they might have a small allocation but the funds that they manage are on behalf of clients which means they've got to convince the clients to actually put the money into the bitcoin into the Bitcoin iShares fund. So all of these all of these fund managers need time to train their salespeople and then utilize time to sell a product. And for that, I think if the halving is in April, I think it's pretty good to get it done by January so you have three or four months to actually sell the product. Yeah, that's a good point. I think something people often don't talk about enough is that the halving is a demand catalyst. And I think that's going to be more of the case going forward. If you just look on chain in the the months after the halving, there's a lot more activity. And then now we're starting to see like CNBC's talked about the halving mainstream media. And, you know, back in the, the 2020 halving, it still was very niche. Not a lot of people knew about the event. But I think coming into this halving, a lot of people are going to they're going to see it on the news and they're going to hear about it. And they're going to be like, wow, Bitcoin's ripped every time this has happened. And it's sort of like a self self-fulfilling prophecy at that point because the demand's going to step in. So what are your overall thoughts on the halving? Some people don't think it's bullish and they think it just happens to tie in with these macro cycles. What are your thoughts there? I think it's a bit of everything. I think it's a bit of everything. I think everything helps and I think everyone wants their own unique perspective so everyone comes out with, you know, what they think is going to happen. The main macro story here for me is that the halving is, pri it is not priced in. The halving is programmed. Everyone knows what's going to happen. Everyone knows when it's going to happen. We know the supply is going to go down by half every halving. The thing we don't know is the demand shock that's coming with the ETF. That's more unique with this story this time round than the halving. I think there's awareness around the halving. I think people have, the average person, when you speak to them about Bitcoin, they know about the halving, right? Um, I think the halving is well known. I think the halving is well studied. Uh, and I think the supply levers of Bitcoin are, com are understood at this point by the people that matter. I think the demand side is being overlooked. And that's what I think the story of this next cycle will be. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess if the 2020 cycle was all the COVID money printing tying in with the halving, then this time it's going to be the ETF and all of that demand sort of tying in with the having, And you made a good point there too, because I don't, I don't think most of the world knows about the having. but you're right. The people that matter and the people with the capital, at this point, they know about the having. They yes. have to. So you, re you released a video in the last week or so talking about how a recession doesn't necessarily mean like 
the end of the world for Bitcoin. A lot of people think, oh, Bitcoin's never been through a recession. We don't know how it will perform. Why do you think Bitcoin can still go on a massive bull run, even if we go into a recession in the next year or two? Listen, the current system itself is worth $900 trillion. If we go into a recession, what people think is that no more money will be printed if we go into a recession. That's a complete and utter misalignment to actually what happens. If we go into a recession, it actually creates more latitude for the Fed to print more money to ease into the recession, to allow the recession to be softer. So if a recession happens, what, what, what a lot of doom and gloom boomers and thousand dollar net worthers believe is that as a recession happens, credit contracts. While it may do in the short term, what actually happens is as a recession happens, they have the ability to expand credit. So if a recession happens, the best thing that can happen is that a recession happens. It, it, the best thing that it sounds awful, but the best thing that can happen is 10% of the of the, pop, of the population of the workforce loses their job, because then tomorrow the Fed will be out saying interest rates are zero and we've printed a couple trillion dollars in order to do this. And unfortunately for most people, is that that money that money finds its way into risk on assets, not their pockets. So while it's awful for most people, it would be great for anyone with risk on assets. So a recession yeah. is not the, the, the death nail for Bitcoin. It's in fact, you know, the rocket boost is turning on. Yeah, I agree. And I guess that's why education is so important just on how money works in general, right? Because all you have to do is buy hard assets because when the recession inevitably happens, we've seen over and over again, they always just resort to printing more money. And there's no reason to think do. this next time would be different. It's all yeah. you can do. Right. And, and if the U.S. wants to remain its preeminent position and extend its life for another hundred years, all it's going to do is go through a period of very high inflation for two or three years and reduce the debt to GDP ratio. And you're good. You've got another 50 years to worry about. Kick the can down the road. And what is the, the one thing I can guarantee every politician will do? Kick the can down the road. Guarantee that. There is not one politician, I don't care what anyone thinks about RFK, Vivek, Trump, I, I don't care what anyone thinks about anyone, there is not one politician that will not kick the can down the road. Yeah, I totally agree. It's all in their personal incentives, right? Because no one's going to be the guy that, that runs on the platform, oh, I'm not going to kick the can down the road, we're about to have a nasty recession if you vote for me. Nobody's going to do that. No one's doing that. So... That sort of answers one of the questions I had, which is, you know, what is your long term macro thesis? Because obviously we have this huge debt problem building up and you like you said, they're going to have to inflate it away. Do you think we get hyperinflation of fiat currencies or do you think they can sort of push the line without going all the way to hyperinflation? I, I think that you need some form of aggressive inflation. I think the CBDCs are going to play a big part in this because it is easier to have the hyperinflation when you have a CBDC where I can print money and send it straight to you rather than relying on corporations to get it to you where there's corruption in the middle. And I can utilize behavioral economics to allow that inflation to take place without causing as much damage as normal human nature would allow. So I think, unfortunately, the CBDCs are coming because they're essential to the next stage of this debt system, this dollar debt system that we have. I think that there will be a period, I'm not sure when it will be, but it will be within the next 25 to 30 years where there is a significant period of inflation. Uh, and all that will happen is people will be sent airdropped money into their bank account or to their CBDC wallet, where while the prices are going up, Sure, the purchasing power is still maintained because people have more dollars in their bank account that they've just been given. So their life doesn't suck as much because they're being given airdrop the money to buy what they need to buy. But at the same time, the inflation is still taking place. Yeah. And so in that sort of society, there is no savings. There's no planning for tomorrow. You just spend what you make ASAP because it's not going to be worth crap tomorrow well the, the smart people in that society will take their you know let's say their airdrop three grand a month they'll take that and they'll live figure out how to live on two grand a month and they'll take the grand a month and they'll buy assets with it 
Um, that's what rich people have done forever, right? So, and that, so that story never changes. It's just, can you structure your life so you can take a percentage of your income and put it into assets or not? Yeah, I think that's huge because if you if you can't live off of more than your income, then like Bitcoin is of no use to you, right? Because you don't have anything to save. So I think right. the quote unquote savings pill is what most people need to take because most right. people just. You know. Right. This is why I always say it, it sort of pisses people off that rich people need Bitcoin more than poor people and poor people need Bitcoin adoption more than rich people. Right. But rich people need Bitcoin more because they actually have shit to protect. I actually mm-hmm. have a $5 million property portfolio that's drowning and I need to protect that. I actually have $10 million in stock, right, in the market that I need to protect that isn't keeping up with debasement. A poor person earns $2,000 and spends $2,000. What do you got to protect? Nothing to protect. That poor person needs people paying them in Bitcoin. That poor person needs Bitcoin adoption way more than the rich person. That's a really good point. You mentioned stocks and and real estate there, and I want to get to that, but I got one more question on the CBDC while we're there. How do you envision that playing out? Do you think it would be the co-opting of an existing stable coin, or do you think they would come out with something new? I think it's something new. I, I think you don't want to shock the market, but I think it's something new. I think eventually the idea of a Fed wallet starts coming out. You start downloading a wallet on your phone that you know the Federal Reserve has. You start consolidating all your bank accounts into that. And then eventually they just say, right, we're shutting down bank accounts, consolidate it into the Fed wallet. Yeah. Do you, would you expect that to be global or would like the Bank of England have, have their own CBDC or would it just be a yeah, dollar? Yeah, I think everyone everywhere? has their own CBDC. I think yeah. everyone has their own. The, the better thing to do would be to just let the Fed handle it. But I think everyone has their own CBDC. Yeah, I, I think that would probably be most likely. You put out a tweet recently, and I'm going to read you word for word because I really like this one. It's irresponsible for a parent to recommend their children buy property versus own Bitcoin now. Every generation has its asset, and this generation's is Bitcoin, not real estate. Why do you think this is the case and how can you say it with such conviction? Well, my parents, for example, my dad immigrated to the United Kingdom and his family bought a house in 1971, conveniently the same year as Nixon nuked the dollar uh, with, with, uh, with its backing. And, you know, that house was bought for £4,200 and it's now worth roughly half a million pounds. In order for that compound annual growth rate to continue, the house would be need, would need to be worth, I think, something like 59 million pounds within the next 52 years uh, as now. Basically, I think the juice has been squeezed from real estate as far as, you know, this debt-based system that we have. And I think that's where Bitcoin comes in. I think Bitcoin is the asset of choice when it comes to how do we print money and where do we put it? Because that's all these assets are. It's a credit game, right? You don't Mm -hmm. buy a house because you want the house. You buy a house because the government incentivizes you to borrow money and put it into that house. So if you can do that with Bitcoin, you don't need the house, right? I just print a bunch of money, put the inflation into Bitcoin. Everyone can finally have a house to live under and we can go back to using houses for what they're for, which is lifestyle choices, not investment choices. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think people have to wake up and realize the easiest thing you can do is say to someone, this is what I did 50 years ago. This is what works. So you should do the same thing. That's unwise. It's not, it's not the wisest thing that a parent should be doing. A parent's job is to help a child look into the future and utilize the experience that they have and figure out what the future might hold. And I think when you look at Bitcoin, you understand Bitcoin and you realize that this is the scarcest asset humanity has ever seen. I think the smartest thing for a parent to do is to tell that child to own Bitcoin, not a property. Yeah, I agree. And if you just look at the price of real estate, not priced in dollars, but priced in Bitcoin, it goes down over time continuously. I'm, I'm only 23 years old. I hammer this point to my friends because they look at me as like the 
economics crypto guy or whatever. I hate the word crypto. And they're, at, they're like, oh, do you ever want to buy a house? I'm like, not really, because I could just buy Bitcoin instead. But if I were going to buy a house, you're not going to get there by saving dollars. You're going to have to save in Bitcoin, because if you save in dollars, then it's just, you know, you're running the wrong way against the current, right? Because the inflation is going to make the nominal price of the house go up. Or if you save in Bitcoin, you can actually sort of catch up there. Yeah, think about, about it. You got you got wage price inflation that's happening at fifty percent of the actual price inflation that's going on, and fifty percent of the probably seventy five. It's probably a quartile of the price of property going up, mm -hmm. and so you think about it and you go, you want to save those dollars or pounds that you're earning. That is only going up at say two percent a year. And you want to save that to eventually buy an asset that's going up at 9% a year. And so every single time you save it, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot, thinking that one day I'm, gonna, I'm going to buy this asset, right? Like it doesn't make sense. The only reason people manage to do it is because they take on more debt. While you may have used a 30% loan to value to buy a property 50 years ago, you're now having to use a 95% loan to value. So the bank owns 95% of that property because you can only put down 5% of the deposit because of how you've been saving. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the problem. And I think we've reached a max. What are you going to do? Borrow 120% against the value of the house now? It doesn't make sense. We've reached the end of it. So, you know, you need to figure out what's next, what's going to last for the next 50. Yeah, I agree. What do you think about, about equities then? Because someone might say, well, why? If I can't buy real estate, I should buy Bitcoin. Why don't I buy a stock? Taking Bitcoin off the exchange and putting it into self-custody is a big responsibility. And if you're going to do that, which you should, you need to make sure your seed phrase is secure. Simply writing it down on a piece of paper is not the best way to go about it. All sorts of things can go wrong when you do that. You're going to want to stamp it into metal. Using one of Stamp Seed's metal plates, you can ensure that your seed phrase is immune to fire damage, water damage, and just general erosion that happens over time. Head to stampseed.com and use the code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% 15 off at checkout, and you'll sleep much sounder at night knowing that your Bitcoin seed phrase is stamped securely into a metal plate. Yeah, I mean, stocks, stocks, will, be, stocks will be decent, but again, these are all market caps that are, you know, they, these, are, these are market caps that have been exhausted. Stocks in the U.S. are $140, $150 trillion market cap, and Bitcoin's market cap is now growing. Right. So you look at stocks and you go, if I if I look at the triple leveraged QQQ, which is TQQQ, that gives me similar returns to Bitcoin. So but now I need to take a triple triple leverage risk option on the Nasdaq in order to do that and in order to keep up with debasement. The one chart that everyone should look at and bring up is the value of the Nasdaq, for example, but valued in M2, US M2. Because while the price of the NASDAQ has gone up and it looks like people have made a ton of money, the value of the M2, uh, sorry, the value of the NASDAQ is not kept up with the amount of money that's been printed. And the reason for that is very simple. There is a difference between price inflation and debasement. Everyone focuses on price inflation. I focus on debasement. If I own 1% of the money supply today, I want to make sure that I control 1% of the money supply in 20 years. What's happened is, is that people have put in a million dollars and they've been given $4 million, but their control of the overall money supply has gone from 1% to 0.3%. And therefore, your, your wealth has gone down. It's not like it's gone up. While you might be looking like you're richer because you have more dollars, Everyone else also has more dollars and you don't have enough dollars. Yeah, I take it you're not a fan of CPI then when people refer to the CPI basket as the inflation rate. Would you think it's, it's better to just look at M2 if you want to know the true rate of monetary debasement? The only thing that matters is how much of the total money supply you control as an individual. And as long as that is increasing, your wealth is going up. At the bare minimum, you want to maintain that. You know, during 2020, I had a bunch of, a bunch of clients that told me, oh, my wealth went up by, you know, 30% in the year. I was like, great, they printed 40% of US dollars in that time period. So what the fuck does it matter? Yeah. You're actually underperforming the debasement that happened. And you're so happy because Morgan Stanley called you and said, we made 30% this year. 
you got fucked. Yeah. Imagine that. The most successful investment year of returns and you still got screwed. Yeah, but most people don't see it that way. Yeah, but that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's the whole story of the entire 2010s, right? Interest rates were basically zero. People, you know, any midwit with a 401k could just throw at a basket of stocks and they're like thinking they're Warren Buffett or something, but it's just the currency getting devalued. They're not actually making really wise investments. Right, because the, a wise investment happens when you control more of the overall market than you did, not just when you have more dollars. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to urge people to think about. You know, my parents' property portfolio needs to be valued 50 to 80% higher than it is to maintain its value that they started putting into it 30 years ago. That's insanity. That's insanity. So, you know, that's the issue with the stock market. Yeah. What do you think the right Bitcoin allocation is? And does, does that answer change based on the person and where they are in life? Yeah, I think it definitely changes on the person. I think the poorer you are, the higher the allocation should be. Again, this is not advice. This is just my perspective. You know, I, I think that if you're worth a million dollars, it's probably not going to be 100%. It can have a high chance of being 100%, but it's probably not because you've got other stuff, right? You've got other stuff that you love. If you're worth $10 million, you've probably got a home. You've probably got some watches. You've probably got some art. You've probably got some stuff that you really love. So then it slides down. But I think the, the, the poorer you are, the higher it should be. Yeah, that, that makes sense because if obviously if you're worth billions of dollars, then you only need a little bit of Bitcoin. If we're right about you know, massive inflation, then that little bit of Bitcoin is really going to go a long way. Well, the goals, are diff- the goals are different, right? Yeah. Like if I'm Warren Buffett, my goal is to preserve my wealth, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm me, my goal is to grow my wealth. So yeah. I have different, I have, and if, 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 the, if I'm, you know, a, uh, blue collared worker at 24, 25, 26 years old, my, my goal is to generate some wealth. So these are all different, different goals and, the, and the, the allocation should be different based on what the goal is. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's why I get so irritated by guys like Dave Ramsey telling everyone to diversify because to quote Michael Saylor, diversifying is selling the, the winner to buy the loser, right? right. Diversification is for preserving wealth, not for building wealth. Someone my age needs to focus on building wealth. Yeah, the, divers- a- the diversification part should only, diversification is important when the returns are no longer adequate, right? So I will diversify some of my Bitcoin holdings when the compound annual growth rate over five years slips to below 20%. Right? Because at that point, I can probably think of other things that can generate me a higher than 20% return. That's, that's yeah. the way I think about it. Gotcha. Do you think the, the market cycles are going to continue in Bitcoin? Or do you think the volatility might go down going it forward? Like we might not have these 80% bear market drawdowns? The, the problem is, is that we've never ever had a proper demand shock to the market. So I can't tell you that. Right. If if the demand levels continue at the levels that they've been that they've been happening for the last few cycles, then we just, you know, yeah, we reduce that. Right. Because everyone knows what's happening. What happens when the total demand into Bitcoin jumps from 20 billion dollars in a bull market cycle to one hundred and fifty billion dollars? And the type of buyer coming into the market isn't someone who's 23 and trading or 34 and, and, and speculating to, to grow wealth or, you know, 50 and trying to figure out what the next thing is. But when they're 65, 70 years old and they know how to hold assets forever, mm-hmm. right? They have the skills and the connections and the access to hold an asset forever without ever letting it be sold. What happens when the buyer is completely different? That's what I think the biggest threat in this next cycle is. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. So I guess you would sort of need a shift in just general sentiment among investors, right? Because if you could get those passive allocations to Bitcoin instead of, say, a 401k, then that might be able to reduce some of that, that bear market volatility. Would you agree Absolutely. with that? Yes, absolutely. But, you know, the, the, the difference with Bitcoin and every asset is, is that the price is set at the margin, 
right? So it's whatever the available Bitcoin on the market wants to trade for is. Now, if you suddenly have a, a large shift in demand because the price is, is going down and you only have 500,000 coins on the market at that point, those 500,000 coins are setting the price. Yeah, that makes sense. On that point, I'm sure you've seen a chart of exchange balances recently. It's gone down. It's, it's plummeting. The first you know decade of Bitcoin's existence, it was up only, but this having epoch, we've seen it go down. Following that logic, and the idea of price being set at the margin, do you think this next bull market, we could break the trend of diminishing returns because exchange balances are down? Possibly. It just depends on what happens to how much influx of new demand there is because of an ETF or yeah. whatever else. Possibly. I think the diminishing returns does fall at some point. I just don't know when. Yeah, that makes sense. You put out a tweet recently talking about family values and gener generational wealth. You referenced the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. Can you tell us more about what you learned from studying them? Yeah, I was looking at, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine and me and her were talking about what the ideal amount of children to have would be. And so I started looking at like the wealthiest families and they all have more than, you know, two uh, and seems to be less than 10. And so I was looking at like, okay, what what is... How does this work? And how it works is very, very simple. It's very, very primal. You have children. You set a vision. You execute on that vision. You accumulate resources. You have children. You put them in strategic places to grow that wealth. And you put other children in strategic places to nurture that wealth. And it just continues. But there is one person in the family that sets that vision. And that's what the beautiful thing about the Rothschilds is. I know, the, I know the Rockefellers get all the attention because it's the American dynasty, but the Rothschild dynasty is, with respect, on a different level. Um, and how he did that was he put his five sons in different important banking cities around Europe, and their, their job was to expand the banking empire that he put in place. He then took his daughters and he inspired his daughters to nurture the empire once the empire was accumulated. And that balance created the single most powerful dynasty that we've ever seen. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, a, lot, a lot of people don't like the Rothschilds. I'm not particularly a huge fan, right? Because they were part of the group that, that created the Federal Reserve, but it is... You know, you wouldn't can learn you? a lot from someone wouldn't, like that. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Wouldn't you? Imagine if you controlled the entire debt system. Wouldn't you have offices in America, Europe, Asia, and every other country to make sure that what you wanted happened? I would. Let's just be yeah. honest about it. I would. That's all the Fed is. The Fed is the office to manage the debt collections, right? So I would do the exact same thing. And imagine if you controlled a $900 trillion debt-based empire. Wouldn't you have certain rules in place or certain things going on to make sure nobody screwed that up? I would, right? If someone walked in, which state do you live in? I'm in North Carolina. Right. Is that a gun-friendly state? So, no. so. more. Yeah, more so than not. Right. So if someone walked into your house to try and rob you and you had a gun, are you allowed to shoot them? Yeah. Right. So if, if I controlled a $900 trillion empire and somebody was trying to fuck with it, am I not allowed to protect the empire? That's a good analogy. And if that, if that protection of the empire means I have to distract the peasants so that they're worried about race and gender and all this other stuff while the empire continues, don't I have the right to do that? Yeah. Everyone That's... looks at these people like they're aliens. They're not. They just got very, very strategic and very, very smart with how to build their empire. So now that they've built their empire, they want to protect it, right? Now it's yours and, and, and my job to figure out how to not be subjugated by that empire, mm -hmm. but it's also their job to protect it. That's yeah. how it works. It's, it's very, very simple. So I guess we need to build a Bitcoin empire and start having a lot of Bitcoin children and, and spreading Absolutely. the word that way. I, I reckon it will be very, very smart 
for Bitcoiners who have children to network with each other and make sure that the Bitcoin stays within the family. It's just old school shit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How do you think about multi-sig in that scenario? Because it seems the best way, like this problem of passing your Bitcoin down, it really hasn't existed with any other asset because with real estate or stocks, you can use the legal protections. But if I'm the only one who knows where my keys are and I croak, like there's no way for my children to, to get them. So how do you yeah. sort of think about that problem? Well, there's always, you know, there's companies right now, Casa with, you know, and what Unchained is doing. Um, there are great multi-sig multi options. And at the end of the mm -hmm. day, there will be lawyers involved. There will be trusts involved. These, these entities, uh, these entity structures are already there to protect your wealth for, for, for multiple generations. So nothing new is going to happen. People think that Bitcoin is going to come up and this whole new world is going to be created. The rails are already there. There's already asset protection laws, right? There's already financing laws. There's already financing structures. Bitcoin's just going to come in and be the preeminent asset that fits into that. Better than real estate, better than stocks, better than gold. So the, yeah. the rails are already there. The systems are already there. We just haven't had an asset that works as well as Bitcoin to really push that to the max. What do you think about then the people who cry, change the money or like fix the money, fix the world? Do you think Bitcoin's a silver bullet and it's going to fix a ton of the problems? Or you think the world be more or less the same on a Bitcoin standard? I think that Bitcoin fixes the incentives. And I think if you fix the incentives, eventually you change behavior. So do I think that as more people learn about Bitcoin, that the incentives will change and therefore their actions will change? Yes. The hardest part that I see is that I think we're about to enter a world in the next decade where the uh, Bitcoin adoption continues to climb, but Bitcoin's awareness goes down. That sounds funny, right? But what I mean by that is, look at Strike, right? Amazing product. You're in the US, I'm in the UK, I can be debited pounds from my account, get sent over the Bitcoin rails and gets credited in dollars onto your. Do you give a fuck whether Strike is using Bitcoin or Visa or, or Swift or anything else? No. All I want to do is exchange, send value from me to you. Mm -hmm. And so you can have Bitcoin adoption continue to grow like that while awareness of Bitcoin declines. That is how the internet works. We're using Riverside to record this. I don't know how the fuck this works. I'm just using it, right? That I think is the next stage for Bitcoin. I hope I'm wrong because a lot of people will miss out on understanding what the beauty of the technology is. As I'm sure that there are people who created the internet really pissed off at me and you for using this software without understanding how the internet actually works. But that's mm -hmm. just how it works. Yeah, that makes sense. When, as you started saying that, my mind went to the internet too. Because I imagine in the early days of the internet, everyone was like kind of a, a geek and they all knew the technical details. And then as more people come along, they're just like, it's user friendly at that point. How do you think self-custody plays into that picture then? Because if people don't really know how Bitcoin works, they might not understand why it's so important to take uh, custody of your own coins. Name me one asset that has scaled above a $20 trillion market cap. That's a bearer instrument today. I don't think one exists. There isn't one. Because unfortunately, as much as the dream is, is, is noble, in reality, people do not want responsibility over their own assets. Now, do I think they should? Absolutely. Do I think they will? No. So I think that's why the ETFs are important, the different products are important, you know, the Bitcoin getting into retirement funds is important, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, I don't think people will. I think people should, but I don't think they will. And do you think the incentive there is to rehypothecate it if you're the custodian? Um, I don't know yet. I don't know yet, right? Because they can already, like if I, you know, the European Union, the US already has directives in place where I can custody Bitcoin in a bank. They haven't done it yet. But the point of doing that is so that if I can custody Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is worth a million dollars, I can lend out $20 million against that. So mm -hmm. the, the rail, again, I say the rails are already here. 
the rails are already in place. We've just never had a pristine collateral like Bitcoin to be able to maximize the rails yet. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I definitely agree with the idea of responsibility. I think most people, because it's really not hard to self-custody, you keep track of 12 words, like anybody can do it. It's just that, that leap scary. of faith. Yeah. It's not hard, it's scary. Yeah, it is. I was nervous the first time I did it, but now it's Me like too. second nature. Yeah. What do you think about Binance right now? Because over the summer, it seemed pretty evident that they were dumping Bitcoin to support their BNB token. So do you have any thoughts on Binance? I think Binance is, I, I think my thoughts on Binance are irrelevant. I think the geopolitics on Binance is very relevant. I don't really, you know, let's have a look at what Binance represents. Binance represents a Chinese exchange that is allowing, in the US definition, illegal fund transfers to occur on tokens that are securities and not regulated by US authorities and US securities laws. And most importantly, it represents a Chinese foreign exchange. And so if I was the US and I was trying to gain preeminent position when it comes to Bitcoin, I would either want Binance co-opted by the USA under US laws, or I would want Binance gone. And I think the next exchange that falls will be Binance at some point within the next five to seven years. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong. I hope what they do is they get co-opted by the USA. But if I was the strategic mind of the USA and I was playing Hunger Games, I need to kill Binance. Yeah. So if you're holding coins on Binance, get, the, get them off immediately. Yeah, I would definitely second that notion. If I had to choose, I mean, I th when FTX went down, yeah, it was bad for Bitcoin in the short run, but I think over the long run, it's healthy to get bad actors out of the space. Of course. And I wonder if, you know, there's not anything to necessarily confirm that Binance doesn't have the Bitcoin that they say they have. So if they, if they don't, then it's good. You definitely want to be one of the first ones out the door to get your, your Bitcoin off the exchange. But if they do have it all, then people might say we're fudding, but it's like, all right, no harm, no foul then if we tell people to get their Bitcoin off the exchange and they actually have all the, the deposits. Well, here's the thing, as a, as a Bitcoin maxi, right? It's, we're, it's not like we're saying, get your Bitcoins off of Binance, but leave them on Coinbase, right? Or leave them on Swan Bitcoin, right? Who's got an issue now with their custodian. Mm -hmm. um, you should always, and that's one of the things I, I compliment Swan Bitcoin on because, you know, I think they have an 85 plus percent of people who buy from Swan and take it off immediately, mm -hmm. but they still have an issue with their custodian, right? Same as everyone else. This is not a unique problem. This is this is a ongoing issue with everyone. The custodian is very, very important. So. Yeah, always take your Bitcoin off the exchange if this is the if this if you want to truly understand what Bitcoin is and, and benefit from what Bitcoin does. Yeah. That's a good point because people have been given Swan a lot of crap, but I everyone from their team always says take self custody. Yes. Like you can't you can't trust a single custodian. That's at the yes. end of the day. Uh, you have So yeah. I've got I've got one more question before we wrap up here and I'm going to start asking this to everyone who comes on this podcast and I actually Am I, I took this idea one? from uh, no I actually I asked Zach Bradford uh when I recorded with him earlier this week and I right. I'm taking this one from Peter McCormack his session he did in Australia but it's a simple question but I think it's it could be powerful and I'd love to hear different people's answers what does bitcoin mean to you Bitcoin means an opportunity for people who want to work hard, who want to serve in the best way that they know how to serve the world with, during their life. And it serves as an opportunity for them to actually protect the energy that they're putting out into the world for use in the future by their future. 
by their children, by their grandchildren, by whoever else. So Bitcoin is finally an opportunity to escape the 230 years of fiat subjugation and have total control over your soul's energy on this planet while you are here. Yeah, I like that. That was, uh, that was well said. Where can the audience find you and, and your work before we wrap up? Uh, just go to the most well-known site on earth, youtube.com, and type in British Huddle. Got it. You have, a, you have a Twitter account too, which we'll, uh, we'll plug in the, the description. Thank you for coming on, British. Uh, this is a good chat. We'll have to do it again sometime. You're very welcome, my friend. Thank you for having me, and best of luck with everything. Appreciate it. See you, everybody.